I'm starting off with a slight picture here on the front first uh, slide. This is the Invista Wetlands in Victoria, Texas. It was built originally by DuPont 20, 23 years ago. We designed it. And uh, I'm just presenting it as a, as a kind of a teaser because this system here is designed to treat uh, about one and a half million gallons a day of wastewater from a biological treatment system from a nylon manufacturing facility. Uh, but it was built as a uh, proof to the community that the water could be safe to discharge to the nearby river. And as part of that proof, they built a living laboratory in the middle of the system. It's an open uh, laboratory that they uh, staff and monitor and uh, use to track the wetland progress. But that now is a, a key part of the educational curriculum of uh, all the schools within a 150 mile radius of the site. And it's just an example to say that you know, industry has the capacity and interest in building wetlands and making sure they're serving the community. I'll explain more. Get the, this thing to work here. Okay. All right. So, uh, topic coverage here a quick introduction to engineered wetlands, what we mean, uh, why industry builds wetlands, uh, a note about water quality characterization of industrial waters, and some examples of nutrient treatment, mine water treatment, remediation treatment, and uh, a few closing comments. So we'll start off with engineered wetlands uh, as a component of natural treatment systems. So I think most of the folks in this call probably compared to many audiences already have an idea what this is about. So forgive me if I'm stating the obvious here, but uh, natural treatment systems are any low maintenance water treatment method that doesn't require continual chemical addition and monitoring. The approach inherently relies upon natural, biological, chemical, and physical processes occurring at natural rates. And all of this work is, and the approach is based upon historic observations of natural polishing of impacted waters in natural wetlands. Uh, the, the basis for our, this work extends back more than 30 years uh, in the, those observations. So they offer a lot of advantages uh, compared to conventional treatment systems. Uh, typically, there's a substantially lower construction and operating cost. Uh, low maintenance efforts uh, because of its mostly relying on natural processes. Uh, no or limited use of power and chemicals. Typically, these systems are designed for gravity flow uh, and uh, natural inputs of um, uh, nat natural processes of, of chemical removal and uh, biological assimilation. Uh, they're essentially uh, health and uh, they're essentially healthier and and, and safer safer than uh, uh, conventional systems. No, nothing can explode out here. Uh, people can't uh, fall off a a railing, for example, so there's that inherent safety. And um, they, they really uh, can be operated in places where maintenance, a daily maintenance this isn't required. And so uh, uh, it's, a, it's not such a panacea though there are disadvantages. Typically the trade-off here is a uh, land area. Uh, you need large land areas to accommodate these flows. And uh, often it's, you have to, there's a bit of a work, work challenge to convince the regulatory agencies that this is an equivalent method of treatment. So there's education and coordination required. And finally, uh, the management needs are different than a conventional system. Um, mosquitoes uh, may be a different kind of an issue to, uh, and managing them may be a different issue than for an industrial facility manager. So uh, I think most everybody's here is aware that in, uh, the wetlands, engineered wetlands, can be both natural and constructed, uh, and they're really designed, though, to achieve a water quality objective. Uh, in Florida, we use uh, natural wetlands for assimilation of, of municipal wastewater. We have rules for that, and the engineering for that is distribution and uh, maintenance of mass loads. Uh, the conventional approach, though, is to build a marsh, a shallow marsh, one to two feet deep, where the water is applied at one end and moving um, uh, moving laterally through in a sheet flow pattern or a subsurface flow marsh. Uh, it's basically a gravel bed, media bed with plants in it, and the water moves subsurface hydroponically through that gravel media for treatment and assimilation. Of course, uh, there's more to it than that now. There's uh, the, the topic in a uh, general category of intensified wetlands, which are these are designed to balance the need for more land area in wetlands um, and uh, uh, and also, uh, but, but also provide more treatment. And so this figure on the right uh, uh, from a paper written by my colleague, David Austin, shows that uh, 
essentially, uh, if we were using a regular uh, polishing, uh, free water surface polishing wetland for, a, for the flow example they provided, we might need 40 acres to treat uh, that amount. Um, but uh, if, you, uh, if you intensify the oxygenation process or the water movement process to actually uh, subsidize an, uh, an oxygen flow into the system, you can substantially reduce the area. And this, this is a, a, a big trend that we see these days. And sometimes that's directly a matter of injecting air into the substrate uh, and allowing that to be part of the treatment process. And large uh, functional systems have been built, say at the Buffalo and Niagara Airport, there are four acres of uh, large uh, subsurface flow beds. So engineering is possible. So there's a toolbox now that includes more than just wetlands and needs intensified system. We really think consider a spectrum of, of uh, approaches here from whether it's an upland based land application or phytoremediation systems, all the way down to purely aquatic systems with uh, floating wetland islands as a potential enhancement. But in between there, there are mar surface marshes and passive media beds that we're using increasingly. And I've got examples to show all these things. So there's one more take on this, and that is all these different types of systems can be integrated into a passive treatment system designed to accomplish several objectives here. Now, it can be a multiple unit processes in series where the system is designed to first maybe, for this example, uh, remove particles by sedimentation then transform uh, dissolved material uh, biologically and then have a final conditioning step before discharge. But that in so doing, that creates this compartmentalization where you have multiple uh, reactors in series that uh, really pretty much prevents the uh, offer, prevents the potential for short circuiting from inlet to outlet, which can be a very significant impact on performance if it's not managed. And finally, uh, it's increasingly common that operators and owners really want to see a manageable system that they it's and I've been through this myself many times here. Uh, because it's natural, we think that we can't don't need to manage it, but in fact, there are needs uh, to move flow around and uh, uh, change loads. So it's uh, increasingly common to see uh, systems in series where they can be bypassed and provide a greater uh, manageability during maintenance periods. So why would industry build wetlands? Uh, this is, there's a lot of reasons, but first off, of course, is they have an incredible variety of wastewaters to treat. Uh, these wastewaters vary widely in source and composition. Here's a little map of the kind of problems you can see in a mine water system where the valley fills where they're storing waste rock, leaches out materials, waste rock piles, pits, leachates from uh, stockpiles. The, the process, mill process itself uh, can be a, a source of, of uh, contaminants that need to be processed and so forth. So mining in you know, this particular example is just, um, just one example, but uh, sort of surface waters and groundwaters are affected typically. Uh, Power companies uh, have all kinds of stuff to deal with, uh, typically some very salty and high strength materials, uh, uh, just and even other issues like temperature and uh, uh, other exotic chemicals added to maintain uh, flow and manage uh, scaling in pipes, for example. Manufacturing firms uh, also have a process wastewater that can be wildly different than the native ambient conditions. Re remediation projects where you're looking in uh, remedying past uh, legacy contamination can be a, a witch's brew of uh, materials uh, in the, the, both in groundwater and the sediments. Even the, uh, our, our mass transportation, for example, like rail, rail yards, uh, uh, ports, uh, any kind of a high intensity industrial activity in, with a stormwater runoff can have a very uh, difficult uh, water quality to treat. So they have to treat the water quality, but, but industry is uh, looking at things differently these days. It's than they were say 20, 30 years ago. Sustainability really is uh, not an overused word necessarily. We, we, we hear a lot, but, but most corporate, uh, dr uh, corporate organizations and uh, leadership uh, recognize the value of staying in sync with uh, society's needs for a more sustainable future because that's really their business. So the things they focus on are things like reducing water use, reducing energy use, capturing carbon, reducing emissions, and so forth. All these things are really part and parcel of building wetlands for treatment, and uh, they will take advantage of that and, and actually build wetlands for that purpose. And I'm showing here kind of a, the five categories of evaluation in the envision process, which is a 
a quantitative uh, ranking system to rate the sustainability of a project or a business. And um, I uh, really advise you, if you're interested in that, uh, taking a look at that, because there are 60 categories of assessing sustainability, and the industry uh, has embraced this approach to uh, tracking their progress. But mo fundamentally, most importantly, is cost. As you can imagine, they have uh, metrics to meet. Uh, but as I've said before, the natural systems typically have uh, less power, less structure, less monitoring, less chemical cost, low lower residuals, et cetera. Uh, the examples on the right here are from our real projects where we have an acid mine drainage project and a selenium treatment project. And you can see that as a percentage of the active treatment cost, uh, the, both, the, both of these systems were a fraction of the cost for capital and for operations, um, typically anywhere from, we would say 10 to 40% is a reasonable number to say what that spread could be. And these are relatively small projects. That's another advantage. Uh, wetlands can be built to handle very small flows. It's very difficult to build a high intensity conventional system for very small flows and uh, it becomes wildly uh, in cost ineffective. So there's a, uh, one example here in the literature that I wanted to bring to your attention, uh, an excellent paper uh, and example from Dow on their sea drift wetlands in Texas. This is a, a 300 acre pond system uh, that treats uh, wastewater from your uh, petrochemical facility. Uh, they've got an anaerobic pretreatment system uh, that does all the heavy lifting, but then they have to polish the organics out of this water. And they've been, they've, for years, they've been putting it into a pond. And uh, that pond did a great job of degrading the organics, but it also yielded substantial increases in algal-related suspended solids, where you see uh, concentrations of 200 or so uh, coming out. Well, they built the four wetland cells to treat that and polish it, and that reduced the TSS down to a very small amount, uh, it reduced the need for artificial acidulation to bring the pH down caused by the algal activity in the pond. And they did a very interesting uh, long-term economic and life cycle comparison. And as a quick comparison here, this is a, uh, the, the kind of a hypothetical comparative comparison they, they use for their um, analysis. And they compared the cost and the operational effort for their constructed wetland with an equivalent conventional system, which they uh, proposed as a se sequencing batch reactor. And this uh, wetland was built, interestingly, back in the mid 90s, which is more or less when we really started to see uh, the interest in building wetlands take off. So Dow was one of the early adopt uh, adopters. Anyway, as you can see in the green column here, everything is cheaper for the constructed wetland. Over 30 years, they estimate they've saved $282 million based on net present value savings. And the, and the, uh, and the annual operation is on the order of just $100,000 or so compared to uh, an estimated $3 million for the sequencing batch reactor, which ha would have to be refurbished and uh, re decommissioned at some point. So you can see here the very real world example, and I highly recommend you check out this paper um, it's, uh, it's really an excellent example of how to do this kind of analysis, and there's much more to say there. So one last note here on how companies view in natural treatment systems. Dow, as I mentioned before, has embraced the topic. They even have their own terminology for it. They call it engineered natural technologies. They're not wedded to wetlands per se. They uh, propose the use of uh, fighter remediation projects. They've built wetlands, which we've helped them with, but also just managing biosolids and building different ways of dewatering uh, biosolids using uh, wetlands and, the, and a host of other activities out there. Um, it's all, it's all a part of their uh, project assessment these days. And in fact, Dow is looking to generate an equivalent value of a billion dollars over the next um, uh, 10 years or so uh, on the, the value that they get from their projects that uh, such as using wetlands instead of conventional systems that saves them that much more money. So they're serious about it. So working with industrial water and natural treatment systems, there are some caveats and everybody needs to think about this when they're looking at wastewater quality. First off, and this is a great table from Bob Cadillac's book on uh, treatment of wetlands. Uh, there's always a, there's more typically an elevated organic and nitrogen content if it's coming from a manu manufacturing facility. There's usually uh, excess of uh, organic material excess organic nitrogen. Uh, there's usually some advanced process to treat that and they use the wetlands for final polishing. 
But these values can be in the thousands of milligrams per liter of uh, COD, TSS, uh, challenging stuff. Uh, the mineral content can be imbalanced. You might see far more sulfate than you ever would, for example, or some uh, really high value of, of chloride or other uh, uh, ion, and uh, that has to be considered. Uh, the metals may be elevated. Some may be in iron where they may form precipitates. There may be other metals that are uh, uh, that require different kinds of treatment, but they can be also at, as astounding values that need to be uh, treated. Uh, finally, there's compounds that are just toxic. Uh, selenium, arsenic, some of these things you do not, do not want to get into the environment. Uh, so the selection of a natural system to treat those is, is critical. So it's just a word of the wise there. Uh, this is not your average municipal wastewater. But there's guidance on how to approach that. Uh, with this paper by Jim Gusek uh, really did a fun thing here. And he drew out a periodic table of the elements, but then he color coded uh, the different elements by how they might be treated by anaerobic or aerobic and oxidizing processes. For example, you know, we're looking at uh, say iron in the middle here. Iron could be both removed anaerobically and, and bound as a iron sulfide in anaerobic systems, or it can be treated in an aerobic polishing cell as an, uh, as an iron precipitate. And every one of these elements has either a, a preferred mode of treatment uh, and some can be treated both ways, but some are untreatable like chloride, sodium, potassium, these single uh, you know, monovalent ions are really not treatable. Uh, the way you control those is either typically some, some kind of a membrane process or a dilution uh, and or uh, a, 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 essentially a non-discharging evaporative system, which can be uh, biologically uh, uh, operated. But uh, the key point there is that not everything is treatable by natural systems. So for wetlands uh, and we, and for treating nitrogen and phosphorus, we rely upon the annual growth of uh, plants and, and the biota and the uh, senescence and reburial of that material to accumulate uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, the microbial uh, activity of that detrital layer and the sediments in the system provides opportunities for natural nitrification, denitrification to occur. So we get a net removal of nitrogen. Phosphorus is assimilated and essentially buried in the system. In Florida, we have the advantage often of uh, higher groundwater or higher, higher calcium or carbonate composition in our water. And that uh, can co that can precipitate in a wetland. And as it does so, it co-precipitates calcium phosphate. And this is a, a viable method of removal of, uh, of phosphorus in addition to a biological uptake. And there's finally, uh, wetlands themselves are traps for particles. In that case, those particles themselves may be a uh, source of nitrogen and phosphorus. So multiple methods of treatment in wetlands. For metals, we're looking at two main water chemistry types, uh, whether it's an oxyhydroxide bearing water with the presence of iron or aluminum, or if it's a non-oxyhydroxide bearing water, where essentially we're looking to, uh, it doesn't need chemical pretreatment. It may simply be, uh, it may be requires sedimentation, uh, but the iron hydroxide precipitates uh, uh, absolutely require some method of, of removal and storage and separating out uh, uh, that solid material over time. Organics are processed in multiple ways in constructed treatment wetlands, whether they're volatilized or volatilized directly from the water surface or interestingly, photochemically oxidized by sunlight. Uh, commonly, though, most uh, organics uh, are, are partitioned uh, strongly to, set of, to particles, and so they're lost as in uh, sedimentation through the, to the wetland um, of, uh, soils themselves. They may be sorbed. Plants themselves can take them up and transform organics within their um, uh, to plant tissue or just simply convey them out to the atmosphere where it's lost. So uh, what's novel and helpful about all these things about wetlands is that, as you can see, all these treatment processes are happening more or less simultaneously. Uh, they're really complex mixed media reactors with multiple modes of treatment for any one of these uh, parameters. And it becomes kind of problematic to try to pinpoint and actually optimize any particular one process. There's uh, many things going on at once. So I wanted to kind of dive into some case histories to, because uh, uh, that's really what we do. We build these projects and then that's our, that be, becomes our reference point for going forward. And this one is an interesting one. It's a nutrient treatment by a free water surface wetland uh, for Philip Morris, uh, the manufacturers of cigarettes. Uh, this is the first 
probably the only tobacco product treatment wetland in the world. Um, it won in a, uh, several prestigious awards uh, and uh, they're extremely proud of it. And the reason they did it uh, was to basically get out of or reduce their discharge to the James River. It was a voluntary project. Uh, they wanted to earn nutrient, nutrient credits. They had no issue with their permit discharge. They had a very um, reasonable permit for their discharge. And what they do here is that they take uh, tobacco products and, and convert them into, uh, uh, I, well, they take basically waste to tobacco products and convert those into uh, uh, products that can be used for other um, raw materials for other products. But it has a discharge that's very high in phosphorus, extremely high in total Keldol nitrogen and organic nitrogen. And um, uh, it's already gets, the water gets pre-treated or discharges to the wetland through a biological treatment system and activated sludge process. But there's additional aeration and then they add uh, ferric chloride to bring the phosphorus down as well. But still the values are, uh, are high coming out and we're phosphorus values of 100 parts million to uh, 1.3 milligrams per liter. So our design was a configuration of uh, two flow paths, uh, comprised each flow path comprised of three cells. Uh, the total area of the system was about 42 acres, 41 acres. Um, the, the, each uh, flow path was three cells in series. This is the size for treating about one MGD of flow. We've, uh, they've been operating a system since 2008. And I'll share some of the performance data here. <clears throat> the TP load and phosphorus load on average over this time period has been reduced about 43%. They were already below their discharge load uh, uh, limitation to the James River, and now they are additionally almost half as much uh, lower than that uh, requirement as before. So they've uh, they've essentially created um, uh, a credit, if you will, of about 40% of their phosphorus discharge. But interestingly, over time, what we saw was a real range of performance, starting out extremely well and very typical of what you'd expect for this kind of phosphorus concentrations and loading around 80% removal. We saw a big drop after five years of operation and then there's been a steady increase. And the reason for that is this guy here, muskrats came in from the river, completely uh, removed the vegetation that we, so, which we so uh, painstakingly tried to install. And uh, so we had to trap the uh, uh, muskrats. They've removed over 1200 muskrats um, in the first eight years. Uh, it's a very prolific habitat for these uh, animals. And we've also, uh, we encourage them to replant the, the system to in, bring in more biological uh, assimilation material, uh, different plant species, and planting in particular plants that are um, not uh, tasty to muskrats. So it turns out that Aero Arum is one plant, Peltandra, um, that is, uh, uh, they tend to avoid. So now we have a whole wetland full of Peltandra. But you know, helpfully and, and, and notably, uh, the concentration reductions are back to where they are now. But one of the real strengths of this system was the nitrogen reduction. Uh, we saw a, uh, almost complete uh, removal of nitrates and nitrites in the wastewater. Um, the system itself had a, a nice layering of anaerobic sediments and aerobic uh, surface layers and uh, did an uh, excellent consistent job of um, nitrate removal with very little effect uh, on performance during the winter. Part of that's because the water's coming in, it's, uh, it's coming out of a treatment process and it's warmer than ambient conditions. So there's always kind of a, a surplus of, of a warmer water in the system. And this is a, a this project uh, is notable also because uh, it's one of the few I can imagine, I can think of where the, uh, they had a local university um, study the, uh, the colonization of the wetland by bird species and reptile species and, and uh, characterize the vegetation and so forth. So they really studied the ecosystem development and they found that uh, over 230 species of um, plants in the wetlands, uh, or all total 230 species, over 100 species of birds, uh, and all the other components of the natural aquatic system there. And these, uh, the system is used for both educational purposes and demonstrations. It's probably, I think it's Virginia's largest and first full-scale constructed treatment wetland. Um, but it's, uh, it's notable because they did it be, as a voluntary effort. They did it to be a community um, neighbor, a good neighbor to community. And it's been it's really yielded value both at, um, uh, intellectually as well as um, ecologically. Uh, so I'm gonna move to another example using mine impacted water. 
<clears throat> here we have uh, iron and zinc uh, contaminated groundwater from a legacy uh, lead zinc mine in the in northeastern Oklahoma, part of the Tri-State Mining District. It's one of the worst Superfund sites in the world. And what we did is designed a multi-cell system designed to, to passively remove iron through sedimentation in an oxidation pond, polish that through a, a wetland system, and then through a biochemical reactor, which is a downflow anaerobic reactor uh, sized to uh, remove uh, zinc. And then uh, additional ponds for oxidizing and aeration of that water, which tends to pick up uh, strong sulfide and, and organic um, uh, components. And a final polishing cell uh, made of limestone beds for zinc carbonate precipitation before discharge to the polishing pond. Uh, this system has worked extremely well. It's been studied by Bob Nairn at the University of Oklahoma, and uh, he's really been the major architect of the concept. Uh, we just designed and built the whole thing. But it's removed iron from 192 milligrams per liter to about 0.1 in the discharge. Uh, essentially, most all the metals are non-detect or well below any kind of critical uh, threshold and for ecological toxicity. But here in the right, you see that over the last, the, really the 10 years of operation or more, uh, the iron buildup is significant in the first cell. And uh, it's designed for 20 years of life, but that's the part of the challenge of industrial waters like this. You have to accommodate uh, these kind of a, a really non-transformable, non-degradable solids. So selenium, this is a topic close to my heart. I've done a lot of these projects. Here's uh, one of our best performing systems, an integrated passive treatment system uh, in Holden, West Virginia. Uh, this is the case where valley fills from the coal mines uh, were leaching selenium through uh, infiltrated, into infiltrated water. We developed a, a, um, a barrel scale uh, uh, pilot test to look, compare different types of uh, media mixes uh, to treat this. And our, we propose to use a biochemical reactor as a method of treatment. So that the, we vary the components of the media uh, to, to uh, basically wood chip base, but we adjusted the amounts of sawdust, uh, peat, uh, manure, and try to come up with a recipe that works the best. And we compared it to just peat by itself. And you can see in the figure on the right that the inflow concentrations around mid twenties, the outflow concentrations were well below the standard of what we're trying to achieve of 4.7 micrograms per liter. And both the, uh, the, all the organic mixtures more or less uh, worked about the same. Uh, so what we end up with going with was mostly uh, mix D here, which lend a slightly greater removal. So our system was designed as an integrated system. Uh, the first cell would be a biochemical reactor. The second cell is an upflow bed through peat for, for solids retention, but BOD reduction, and uh, basically an extra uh, safety net for selenium capture. A fill and drain wetland to help it make the water more aerobic for, ready for discharge and a final surface flow marsh for final conditioning. You can see in the picture in the lower right here that uh, these systems are built, are really shoehorned might be the better word, at the, into the uh, ravine here at the downstream end of each of these uh, valley fills where this waste rock is stored. And so there's very, uh, this is a case where space is extremely limiting and uh, they're a very remote location. Uh, the system performed very well and has never uh, missed its uh, discharge criterion. You can see the red dots here, are the inflow concentrations over time, the blue dots are the, uh, the concentrations coming from the biochemical reactor in the, in the whole system. Here's some pictures of what they look like. Uh, not pretty. That's one thing about these kind of systems. They're not the beautiful marshes like some of these other ones are. They're really meant to just do the job in a very industrial and uh, like highly land efficient uh, technique, land efficient requirement. Uh, what we know from looking at the removal rates for these kind of systems is that we can expect um, a removal rate that's about eight to 10 times greater than what we would get in a free water surface type wetland. Um, the media itself is reactive. Um, the selenium is captured by multiple methods and uh, uh, retained uh, safely in the system. Another project uh, closer to home, this time I'm getting away from some of the toxic stuff and looking instead at just phosphorus and nitrogen. And this is a project by Mosaic where they built uh, what they call the uh, aquifer, aquifer um, recharge recovery program, the ARP project. And that's a case where they repurposed an existing reservoir. Uh, we pumped 
water from the reservoir into a marsh that had been uh, built for mitigation purposes, compartmentalize that into two subcells, and that water then is pumped to a sand filter for final filtration. It's a large system, 300 acres of marsh, 400 acres of reservoir, so it can handle uh, quite a wide range. We studied it for a couple of years, and what you see in the figures here is total phosphorus on the left and sulfate on the right. And what we see is that the initial waters coming in, both in the two years of study, were about two to three milligrams per liter. But at the exit of the system here, the phosphorus values were down about 0.1 to about 0.2 milligrams per liter, well below the numeric nutrient criterion that had been established for that area. So this system was designed originally to treat uh, excess storm waters uh, and then filter that through the uh, sand filter and inject that into the aquifer as a method of recovering aquifer levels. But based on this performance, it's now being considered as a uh, possibility of using a, uh, as a surface discharge uh, system. What was also interesting is that we saw the sulfate reduction through there. Now this is notoriously a, a difficult uh, compound to treat because if you do uh, reduce sulfate biologically to sulfide, uh, you have to bind it with something and remove it, and or else it'll reoxidize and become part of the waste, waste stream after that. Here's a case where passively over time, I think that sulfate is being biologically uh, converted to sulfide and bound and trapped in the sediments over time. And there's no, uh, this is not a dilution effect either. The chloride balance shows no dilution effect. So one last take here on power and petrochemicals. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note that natural treatment systems really as a technology originated with the use of, of phenolic compound removal uh, back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, work in Germany showed that subsurface flow type beds using uh, bull rush uh, can polish and remove uh, phenolic compounds. Back in the 70s, there was a growing interest in uh, low energy alternatives. So there a big, big facility was built up in uh, Mandan, North Dakota by Amico. It's still operating today. In the 80s, some big projects like Julie's project, the Lakeland project, and Orlando were built. These are for more municipal treatment. But uh, uh, notes were taken by the uh, petrochemical industry, and some other projects were built. Uh, Richmond, California has a very large 90 acre system for polishing water from a petrochemical facility, and uh, others have been built. Uh, we're seeing significant applications now in over in Oman and the Middle East. The world's largest petrochemical treatment well has been built in the Nimmer project, and that's over uh, 700 acres in the middle of the desert, and other projects such as Casper, Wyoming, which I'll show. But summaries of this were written about 25 years ago. It's not a new topic, it's just that uh, sometimes people have to relearn these things. Um, so here's a case uh, as a first example of a project I'm working on in Northern Ireland, where we have uh, water from a uh, Groundwater is contaminated from legacy operations at a DuPont facility. And what we're doing there is we're draining that water from the surficial aquifer through a horizontal well and feeding it through a series of ponds that were already on site but never used. So we've essentially repurposed the existing infrastructure on site for polishing. And essentially, we're getting both aquatic pond and wetland treatment. One compound we're studying is EDC, it's 1,2-dichloroethane or ethylene dichloride. And we're achieving over not, almost 100% removal as best as you can measure it uh, through the passage through the four pond, or these four sequential settling ponds. Removal rates are very high uh, and very and consistent with the literature for what you expect to see for organic compounds. So here's a case where a conventional system would be unnecessary. They've already got the facilities on place to do it. They're just managing and moving the water around. In Casper, Wyoming, they've built a very interesting system designed to be both an aerated subsurface flow system as well as a, some pretreatment with wetlands for iron removal. And they've integrated these uh, facilities into the golf course there. Uh, so uh, it's just, a, just an example to show how uh, there is a way to work with the, the local landscape and landforms uh, and the land uses to implement these kind of projects. And one other topic, I mentioned the, the Nimmer project in Oman. Um, oil and grease is one of those parameters that you hardly ever hear people talk about anymore, but it's come up in some projects recently, and I did went back and looked at some recent papers. And it's quite interesting to note that, you know, we can achieve in a wetland system about 90%, 99% removal of uh, oil and grease. Um, this Nimmer project 
uh, removes uh, oil and grease from um, over 100 milligrams per liter down to 0.1 or less. And it's very consistent with other projects. And it's interesting to think that, you know, wetlands, you know, you would think that oil being applied to a wetland is one of those non-starters. It's such a historically uh, challenging and difficult environmental problem. But under, under appropriate managed conditions and design, you can actually achieve these objectives and, and still maintain a safe environment. So just a quick catch up here. Um, and I hope I haven't gone too fast. I'm trying to make sure we have time for questions here. Uh, but clearly, as I hope you've seen from these examples, that industrial wastewaters are treatable by wetlands. Uh, industries are implementing as wetlands for both cost and sustainability reasons. Uh, the selection of the treatment system needs to match the water quality characteristics. And this is where that characterization comes into play. Integrated compartmentalized designs offer the greatest treatment potential because one unit process might handle one compound, another unit process might handle uh, another. And finally, uh, there's opportunities for building these natural treatment systems in site infrastructure. The Mosaic Project and the project in Ireland I showed are essentially ways for industrial uh, clients and facilities to reuse what they already have. They're very strong in trying to make sure they don't build new assets, they actually rebuild and take advantage of existing assets. So there you go, that's my study. And there's a picture of the R project itself uh, these wetlands once built are look, uh, they gain, they're so important ecologically. The size that's necessary sometimes really creates an attractive feature for wildlife and uh, that can be a good thing. Any questions out there? Yeah, Jim oh. Mahalsik has a question. Sure. So Jim, for there's a lot of students online. Could, could you explain the career path? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, baccalaureate civil or environmental engineer, or I'm getting my master's degree with an emphasis in water resources or environmental engineering, how would I get into this kind of career? Okay, uh, well, let me say from my, my experience, uh, I uh, earned a bachelor's degree in environmental biology a long time ago, 1976, and uh, then a master's in environmental engineering sciences from the University of Florida in uh, 1982. And uh, pretty much jumped right into consulting where the market demand for me personally was more from the wetlands monitoring side. But as I uh, jumped ship into CH2M Hill and then which became bought by Jacobs a few years ago, um, I've almost always been looking at engineered applications of wetlands. So uh, now I think the curriculum that uh, the University of South Florida and other universities offer really uh, acquaints people with those technologies that didn't even exist back then. Uh, for a career in uh, this kind of work, um, there's uh, applications uh, in uh, consulting where we design and build these type of systems. Um, uh, in, in federal and state governments uh, uh, and in, in, in regional agencies, such as the water management districts, which operate, for example, the South Florida Water Management District operates the uh, uh, Everglades uh, stormwater treatment areas. Those are all uh, very large wetlands, the largest in the world, and they have a whole uh, staff built up around maintaining and operating uh, those systems. So uh, there uh, are ample uh, directions to go in, uh, and uh, I'm not just, because I'm kind of figuring out, uh, focusing on Florida here, but it's uh, nationwide, I would say. But um, uh, I, think, I think the objective here for a, a student is to make sure that they uh, come out of their undergraduate degree with at least um, a significant research project that uh, acquaints them with the, the history of the technology and the approaches, uh, the modeling and uh, monitoring approaches. And if it's, if it's possible to earn an advanced degree and master's uh, in either in environmental engineering or a, uh, either an engineering science type of application, that's, that's uh, definitely seen as a plus going into the marketplace. Um, it's a proof to the potential employer that you're able to follow through on projects and complete them, that you can write and that you can then analyze and, and set up a study to, to get to a, a usable answer. So uh, I, Jim, I, I'm hoping that's a helpful hints there. You know, there's probably more to say on that. It, it was great and, and your, your talk was excellent. I'm, I'm embarrassed to have to teach an online class in about an hour. Okay, no, that's fine. I, I realize we're, um, time is limited here. Good to meet you. Yeah, this is 
Serena, I have a bit of a technical question. So I, I guess when I was, uh, I was doing a lot of work research on acid mine drainage remediation a number of years ago. And I recall, and I've also done work in the past on selenate reduction. And I always, uh, we talked about adding uh, some type of, type of organic matter as uh, you know, to drive the um, the process, either compost or horse manure, or in one case with selenium, we were working with molasses waste. Uh, but in your systems, uh, it seems like the maybe the plant material, the vegetation, is is enough, or did you have to augment those wetlands with um, some type of substrate? Yeah, this is the and this our approach on that, Serena. Thanks for helping me clarify that. Uh, I'm going to go back to this example here. Um, uh, uh, for for metals reduction, particularly particularly in acidic waters, um, we'll uh, feed it through a biochemical reactor, and that's this central uh, system here. And water it filters down through a layer of say two to three feet thick of a mix of um, Wood chips, sawdust, uh, hay, uh, small com small amounts of uh, manure, uh, and uh, this material uh, creates an anaerobic process immediately as the water enters that flow path, and that's typically where we see the opportunities for um, metal precipitation of sulfides. In this case here, it's moving completely removing zinc and as a zinc sulfide in this uh, water, so. Uh, to your question, uh, a natural wetland or a wetland of just an emergent marshes can provide that kind of uh, basic organic um, substrate and uh, carbon source needed, but uh, typically at far lower rates uh, than what we would expect to see for, say, a biochemical reactor. So the, the engineering approach here is to um, uh, more or less consolidate all that organic matter into a flow through system so it gets both it both traps the material uh, the, the metal as well as uh, you know adds carbon to the water um, does that sound um, uh, is that, is that, uh, does that does that respond and um, clarify that yes it does Can I, I have another question also you, you know and uh, you, you're familiar with our project looking at that one's Landfill leach shape. Yeah, leach shape. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at using vertical flow uh, wetlands to provide mm -hmm. the aeration for uh, nitrification. But in your talk, you said more airline injection. So I was wondering about uh, the, your experience with those two different approaches. What was the second approach then? Sorry, I missed that in the. Yeah. Well, first, you talked about airline injection. Yeah, yeah. Air mm -hmm. Right. Aeration, I guess. That's right. As to using vertical flow um, wetlands. Or, or. So I was wondering about your uh, experience with those two different approaches. I mean, our, uh, so, uh, so we've, uh, these, these kind of, uh, the whole process of trying to enhance the oxygen transfer within a wetland is is um, is one of those cases where there's multiple ways of accomplishing an objective. Um, the air injection is one method. Uh, the use of a fill and drain, fill and drain approach is another. Um, and uh, we like the idea of the fill and drain because the uh, aeration and Air injection creates a you know adds a mechanical component to the system that has to be maintained, and uh, and can be hard to get right. Uh, in all honesty, I've I've learned it's uh, how the air moves through these systems and these uh, subsurface systems is is different than how it moves if it's being added in through a fill and drain. But 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 we would call that a pulse flow or a tidal flow uh, approach where. Uh, a siphon may be added to the outlet of a system and it fills to a certain level, then it, then it actuates and then drains down. And so that draining process entrains water, uh, trains air into the, the, the bed of the system. And then uh, slowly as water refills, uh, that uh, air it comes in con is in contact with the biofilm and the media and provides treatment. Um, 
So I'm not quite sure I've got your answer there, but I mean, the, the idea is that we try to favor these more passive operating approaches. Um, but for really intense sites like this Buffalo's project I'm mentioning in the upper right here, uh, the, the oxygen needs are so great given the loads uh, because we're treating uh, contaminate, stormwater contaminated by aircraft de-icers um, that it, it wouldn't be possible to get to that level of treatment with a passive uh, approach. Um, did I, <laughs> Serena, did I get your question right? Because it was a little hard to hear you initially, but. Uh, uh, no, I think I have a bad internet connection, but thank you. It definitely answered my question. Okay. Else? Hmm. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so in like your pictures, it was at slide 28 and 29. Okay. Go up there. The, the initial ponds are like very discolored. Like how do you let the public know or without letting them overreact, you know, just let them know it's supposed to be like this. Yeah, right. Great example, because uh, it does look weird. And uh, and it's obviously, there's the pollution, right? It's coming out right in front of you. Uh, uh, this case here, uh, this is actually the brainchild and the major research facility for uh, Bob Nairn at the University of Oklahoma and his, uh, uh, it's the ecosystem research, restoration uh, uh, watershed uh, group here. Uh, and uh, it's, so he has done a uh, outstanding job of outreach to the community uh, where he both in, uh, has invited the public as well as um, clearly worked with the, uh, and closely work, coordinated with the state regulatory and uh, environmental authorities to, to get the good word out on this project. So to your, I think the best answer for your question is that um, if there is a question about this kind of process, and I, I can think of other projects we worked on where that was actually the case. People were saying, is this going to be a, is this going to look bad? Uh, you can either screen it uh, with, uh, uh, from the eye, from the ground level view or people walking around it might not really see it. And that can be screened with a dense vegetation. Or you can, uh, you know, keep it open and honest there and say, this is the treatment process here. And every, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, every 20 years, we'll come in here and scrape this out and uh, educate them as to what's happening in there, how it benefits the system downstream, which in this case here, they clearly saw a restoration of the stream reach downstream of the system that had previously been grossly polluted. So I, I think it's always a matter of like presenting the benefits of the project first and uh, how it achieves it so efficiently and, and ecologically. And then put that puts the, if you will, the aesthetics in perspective then, and then you can uh, work with that. Does that, does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay, sure, good question. Jim, this is Maya Trotz here, great presentation. I had a question on the Envision, and okay. um, do we have any, like how do we push more of that for Hillsborough County? Hillsborough like, County, okay. Yeah, uh, I teach an Envision class where we go through it, um, mm -hmm. and it would be great for the students to actually work on a project that is potentially um, interested in getting certification. Oh, I, I get it. And it's a very uh, interesting process to go through. And it, it really makes you think through the questions of the project basis and implementation very carefully. Um, I would say, is there someone in the county that is familiar with the process? I think they are. Almost every public agency has heard about Envision, I think. Um, it's a, you know, it, it, this is sort of a, of, uh, of a lead, if you will, for infrastructure, a lead rating for infrastructure. And uh, my, my, where I was going with that, Maya, is that if there's someone in the county that can be your champion, that can help you uh, get the word up and around into management uh, levels to, uh, and show it as a, as a benefit, that'd be helpful. Um, there's the uh, infrastructure, uh, the, the sustainable infrastructure site itself has plenty of case histories and how people have, of agencies have implemented this approach and gained recognition and reward for their project using this process. And I think that um, just a general note here is that most of the projects I've shown you here have all been um, implemented by industries, which normally get kind of a black eye. You know, you, you can think of Dow and DuPont and you don't necessarily think about green wetland infrastructure. And uh, they do that on purpose. You know, they, they want to create a counterbalancing perspective in the public's view 
of what they're doing. And you, you've seen it probably on the advertising for Mosaic on TV, for example, that are really um, bombarding us here. But, but the point of that is that they want uh, a, uh, a positive profile and these projects are very good at that. And Envision is a good way to document how positive that profile is. So if you can approach your uh, contacts there and say, you know, what we're doing here is, is um, or what you could be doing with your projects could really earn you some recognition for green projects and for something ecologically sustainable. And this process here, this vision process helps you with that. Um, and, and, and so that you're trying to appeal to their desire for, uh, you know, reward and uh, otherwise uh, grueling or difficult uh, work uh, or public perception. Uh, environment. Does that help or not? Because I don't, you know, it may, a lot of it I've found depends on the personalities involved. If you're dealing with uh, uh, a fairly strict bureaucratic uh, network, you might not see much sympathy or much interest in this approach. But if there's a few, like I say, a few champions in there that you can approach and really have these kind of earnest conversations with, um, I'm sure you can get somewhere with that. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think we have some Envision champions in the Bay and we were from um, the consulting world, like yourself um, mm -hmm. and others. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we should probably put our heads together for, to see how we could get the city and county. Uh, yeah. I find it difficult sometimes to look at these projects when you haven't been there from the beginning. Oh yeah, well, I mean, that's true. I mean, you, you probably see all the ways they went wrong and the way building it, that it could have been more sustainable. And, uh, and that's, that's nothing new really to the Envision world. They, they understand that um, these projects are really kind of built uh, as the, based on the needs and the technologies of the time. Um, but it gets back to, uh, you know, the choices that are made. You may not get a 100% ranking or a rating, you know, a great rating if you but it may be, it's better than zero and it's better than, um, and it's, it's a way to build from that too. Um, I, I, I'm happy to try to follow up with you on this, Maya, in some way. Uh, I, I'm, I think that it's a, there's a great potential here in the Envision process to uh, uh, in, impart a more sustainable approach to construction and building. Uh, just that, like you say, yep, yep sure, okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jim and Maya, Julie here. We at the city of Lakeland and, and Seven Wetlands, we had pretty um, limited internally talked about going for an Envision rating um, just with the existing infrastructure at the wetland that's already there and all of the stuff that we plan to do in the future. Um, we're still very beginning stages of kind of internally talking about that but I'm curious if Jim you know of any wetland type areas that are similar to to us to seven wetlands in Florida that have been ranked with an envision rating or if that's um hmm. mm -hmm. if that's kind of a new you know would seven wetlands be hmm. be the first Thanks. Yeah, no, it's a great question, Julie, and uh, I'm embarrassed to admit I can't think of one off the top of my head here. Uh, uh, I do think, though, that um, uh, there has been some work done in Palm Beach County and some of the projects down there, like Wakotahatchee and Green Cay Wetlands, um, uh, down that path. I don't know how far they got, but uh, um, let me uh, search around and get back to you on that, because um, it seems like a it seems like it, it, it should stand out further in my memory if in fact there had been one, but I don't know, you know, uh, every wetland project out there. Uh, I don't think, I think the only um, Envision certified project we have in Florida is, is the I-4 project, the platinum project in Orlando so far. Okay, yeah, good, good input there, Maya. I, I think that, that sounds right to me too. And um, so Julie, you might be the first one, but you know, the thing about Lakeland is that your project was a, Pioneer. It was only the first really large wetland built um, in in the in the U.S. Really uh, at the scale that you were at there. Uh, nothing else had been built larger than that in 1987. And, uh, and of course, you're really you know essentially rebuilt on, on an old phosphate mine there, and so that would count a lot towards uh, conversion of uh, 
degraded to positive habitats. Um, basically, uh, everything about your project there speaks to uh, a passive and a significant improvement on the environment. So I, I would expect, and I'd be happy to help you with that. I, I think there'd be a strong argument to make that it's one of the best examples of how you uh, how you build these wetlands uh, for uh, in these kind of systems, these kind of situations. So don't be, I would say, don't be fearful of not being, uh, being the first one. You, you, you might really have a winner there, you know, and uh, um, there might be a lot of gain from that. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Th thank you both. In, in your opinion, Mr. Bays, what, what's been the greatest technology or innovation that you've seen when it comes to improving engineered wetlands? Um, okay, great question. I would say it's the model. Uh, the treatment wetland model uh, espoused by Bob Cadlick, what we now call the PKC star model, um, was really the unifying method of uh, basis of design, sizing, uh, calibration, um, uh, performance enhancement, uh, uh, standardization, normalization of wetland projects and their performance. Uh, I know we think about, you know, the, the basin itself, you know, the the conveyance of water to and from the system, but um, knowing how to size it in, re in a reliable way, and, and, and it's become the basis for the construction of the Everglades STAs, essentially it's the basis, um, uh, really uh, has, in, in my mind, you know, made this an engineerable uh, system. Uh, before then, it was like, like Julie's project and some of the early ones back in the early 80s, that was all based on empirical assessments of overland flow type habitats. Um, nothing really was very deeply process based, but uh, um, I'd say that that is the most important thing, honestly. Um, I, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to separate out key projects from that trajectory of, of development. You know, certain projects like Julie's, for example, really proved that you can build large wetlands and that really helped pave the way for uh, the South Florida STAs, for example, or that, uh, you know, projects designed for selenium removal can be, you know, prove that it can be done safely. Uh, it's just that I think the model itself has worked out to be the most transferable and uh, reproducible basis for sizing. Uh, and it's not like it wasn't, it didn't come around without a big, a lot of debate. Back in the mid 90s, there, were de there was definitely a strong and very heated debate about which model to use. But uh, uh, history is, in my view, and it's like you say, it's my opinion, is has shown that that's the big, that's the big step. Is that, and let me quickly ask if, if folks, uh, just quickly, let me quickly state that if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, uh, it's really the model basis described in the treatment well in second edition. And uh, the, that's where you see kind of the updating of that model approach in that, in that book. Jeff actually just uh, put it in the chat box, the citation for it. Okay, great. Well, there you go. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. I know this is, uh, it's not very, uh, we don't have an opportunity to give you a round of applause. Maybe oh, yeah. Unmute themselves. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Thank you.